Strategy and Insider, exploring future trends and their impacts. Welcome to the Strategy and Insider podcast. In this podcast series, we aim to explore some of the most critical future trends as we will be discussing them with industry experts and also actually leading practitioners from various different industry sectors. During our conversations, we will make you familiar with key developments uh, by actually taking you behind the scenes of those practitioners and provide you with insights that we think really matter. Together with our guests of each of those episodes, we want to better understand both the opportunities and the challenges ahead of the change that we are experiencing in various parts of our lives. In our first season, we will discuss some of the most fundamental and critical questions in the healthcare industry. And the future of healthcare will be digitally enabled and data-driven. It will be way more personalized and in the hands of people. It will be way more preventative and also more and more integrated into everyday life. And while technology in other areas like how we shop, how we bank, how we travel has shown tremendous impact already, the impact yet on healthcare is not that big, especially when looking in what is already possible. That's why in our podcast series, we look behind the scenes of what's going on towards that future of health, discussing those topics, the opportunities and the challenges with top executives from pharma, from medtech and others, but also leading academics, um, healthcare practitioners and also new kids on the healthcare block, uh, and talking about technology players, be it big or be it small. My name is Thomas Solbach. And I'm very happy to host the first season of this Strategy and Insider podcast. I'm a partner uh, at Strategy and out of the Frankfurt office, leading anything to do with commercial in the pharma life sciences industry. And uh, in my daily job, I'm working, collaborating with leading pharmaceutical, biotech and also other healthcare companies in building game changing and differentiating strategies but also the capabilities needed in order to live up to those strategies. And in that regard, we just completed our recent study on the future of healthcare. And during that, what really surprised me is that, um, yeah, a lot of change will happen, a lot of opportunities will arise, but also a lot of uh, challenges um, will occur and, and confront existing players as well as new entrants in order to make that future of health a reality. That's why I'm very thrilled uh, to have uh, Dr. Andreas Vicky with me today, who is the chief oncologist of the Kantonsspital basel Land here in Switzerland and has uh, more than 12 years' experience as working as an oncologist. And Andreas and I, we met uh, a good three years ago uh, on a joint project uh, around precision oncology and ever since have been talking about what will the future in oncology, but healthcare more broadly look like. So thanks very much, Andreas, for taking the time and having that discussion with me today. Thomas, thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here as well. So, um, yeah, we, we, we talk about the future of healthcare, but before doing that, uh, probably also digging a little into you and knowing you quite some time now, knowing admittedly that oncology is is a very tough area to work in and, and being confronted with deadly diseases on a daily basis. I mean, how can you actually switch off uh, for, for, for pleasure and leisure at, at, at after work, but also coming here and, and, and having a podcast on, on the future of healthcare? Well, you're right. Um, oncology um, is kind of a tough business. On the other hand, um, I think we have a very close relationship to our patients, which may be much closer than in other areas of medicine. Um, and believe it or not, you know, an oncology consultation can, can be much more cheerful than what you imagine. Okay. So many patients, you know, they, they don't want to talk about the disease all the time. Okay. So many consultations may just be talking about, you know, what, what did you get uh, to lunch yesterday? And then obviously, you know, there are, there are the difficult situations, patients um, who, who just have got bad news. Um, and uh, these are... The situations where sometimes you do take a little bit of what you do in your daily life um, uh, back to your home. 
but that's part of part of the job. I think it's not something I would like to get rid of. So it's it's kind of being a oncologist means uh, caring about the disease and 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 treatment options, but being a psychologist at the same time and and someone to uh, where where a patient can lean towards. It's it's being a bit a psychologist as well, but mostly it's just about you know knowing people, knowing people sometimes for many years, and in in a way being a little bit part of their life. That's a good uh, thing to have in mind. But I mean, when you started back, wh when was it? Eleven, twelve, thirteen years, years ago. Twelve years yeah. ago. Um, I mean, have you experienced some change since in oncology? Well, the, the changes in oncology have been huge. I can give some examples. You know, when you when you look at at, at lung cancer, for example, mm -hmm. non-small cell lung cancer. Twelve years ago, we had three different therapies, and you could choose to give one of those. Okay. Nowadays, just for first line, we have to choose between, let's say, twenty different therapeutic options. Twelve um, years ago, um, biology didn't really play a role. It was histology. So the pathologist told you this is a specific histology, and that's the therapy you will give. Um, nowadays, um, we do sequencing, we look at immunohistochemistries, so there's a whole bunch of uh, biological assessments which happen, mm. which determine what therapy is given afterwards. So in a way, there are more decisions to take. That's certainly a big difference. And, and can I just probe onto that? If, if oncology has more options to choose from and more diagnostics to, to cope with, It is getting way more complex than in the past. How does that relate to you being kind of the psychologist? How much time can you actually dedicate to the patient um, rather than understanding the complexity and maneuvering that? So you're right. It's, it, it's become much more complex. And, and perhaps we, before we come to the question of how to maneuver that, yeah. um, I think, you know, the uncertainty in a way has increased. Uh -huh. Because 12 years ago, usually if you've got metastatic disease, you knew there were some therapeutic options, mm -hmm. um, but it's finally a deadly disease. Yeah. Nowadays, um, there are more therapeutic options, but uncertainty, will I survive mm. um, or will I succumb to this disease, is much bigger than that. Mm. Nowadays, we may have one in five patients surviving long term. Mm -hmm. And I cannot predict who's that going to be. So this means discussing with patients, um, although we have more options, which, you know, is fabulous that we've got more options, um, but the incertitude uh, and the choices we have to make have become more difficult than 10 or 12 years ago. Mm. So meaning that th there is more um, options to choose from, it's getting more complex, it's, it's driving hope of people. Yeah, because it can still be a deadly disease, but probably it's not for, for the very patient specifically. And that drives uncertainty. For most patients, it still is a deadly disease. Yeah. But you now have the choice. You know, do you go for aggressive therapy, which gives you a certain chance mm. um, of uh, becoming a chronic cancer patient? Um, or do you choose to go for more palliative, um, somewhat less aggressive treatment, but diminishing your chance um, to have chronic disease? Um, that's a choice we didn't have 10 or 12 years ago. So you can do it more precise and more personalized to the very patient, it seems. Yeah, yeah? definitely. Okay. And this is also where we met each other, right? And and, and, and drive that personalization to the next level. Uh, Andreas, in, in the future of health study, and, and we obviously had discussions before that and during the study, but um, we also had discussions around one of the outcomes that we found in the survey is that um, there will be massive impact on what you and, and other providers might be doing in, in, in future, given the fact that if we have more data, if we have better means to understand how people are getting sick or stay healthy, um, there, there, there will be a push towards prevention yeah, and digital solutions that, that, that keep people prevented and, and healthy so um, you you did nicely comment on that uh, that this will have a massive impact on your role as a doctor probably you, can you elaborate on that a, a little further on, on how your role might be changing in future the classical classical uh, conception of a doctor was um, you need to know um, how to diagnose a disease and you need to know how to treat it mm -hmm. so basically it's about knowledge mm -hmm. so you go to med school 
to learn um, these two things, diagnostic and therapeutic measures. Um, <clears throat> now the knowledge is expanding very rapidly. So saying, well, I know everything, I can just decide what is the right way to go, um, it's, it's not going to be a solution for the future. Mm -hmm. So learning facts, knowledge, um, is not, no longer going to be the only or the key part in, in medical training. Basically, you need to learn how to gather information and to weigh that information. There are so many different pieces of information, and for patients, it's very difficult to understand that that's a piece of information which is relevant to this specific situation, or it is not. And I think that's a role the doctor will fulfill um, in the future, and they need to be trained for that as well. And how much time can you actually dedicate uh, of your very busy schedule, uh, seeing patients, um, yeah, managing that complexity, uh, being a psychologist? How much time can you actually dedicate to stay ahead of state-of-the-art research and, 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 and knowledge gathering that, that's happening as we speak in the, in the medical community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a big challenge. I mean, even if you if you dedicate a few hours a week to reading journals, you, you, you're never going to be able to cope with all the information which is out there. And it's not just about the medical knowledge and reading clinical trials. It's also about biology information. So doing a sequencing, having 140 or 400 different genes, um, you will never be able to understand what the different mutations mean, how they interact with um, each other. So we need to find a solution where we can um, pull together the information, make sense out of it, and come up with um, a recommendation for our patients. And do you have for, for yourself already a solution on how you can do that and how you kind of keep up with that information? Is there something out there that you can use or do you do kind of well, it's, spot, it's, spot education yeah. on certain topics? It's not a technical issue. You know, it's not just about writing a software. It's because we need to do true prediction what is the best therapy. We need to do true prediction what are side effects of a therapy if I'm going to use that one. Um, and such um, algorithms which take into account um, the information which is there, um, they need to be tested um, also in a clinical setting. And that's something which has not been done so far. So there's, there's not really... Um, a single trial out there um, showing that a certain algorithm um, will be better than another one. So it's a future which we still have to develop. <coughs> It's interesting that you mentioned that because I recently came across uh, an example of, of something called BioMind AI system, which is a university-based system, as far as I understand it. And um, they did go head-to-head -head against, they, they call it allied doctors um, in, in China, um, in who is better at diagnosing brain tumors from MRI scans. Um, and um, surprisingly or not, you call it as, uh, as whatever you would like to, but the AI uh, that was set up and previously trained uh, did come up with 87% right answers uh, in 15 minutes for something north of 200 patients. While uh, really a big bunch of, of allied doctors um, did come up with only 66% right answers in 30 minutes so taking longer time yeah to come up with uh, less good results i mean is, is that an indication of um, we need that uh, algorithm that that ai helping us to to decide in future or uh, do you have big doubts there no i think uh, um, frankly i don't have doubts about that um the results you just you, you just explained, you know, diagnosing a certain disease is something which we have seen the late last two or three years, that artificial intelligence is getting better than doctors. Mm -hmm. It was an example with brain tumors, but for um, <clears throat> we do have data, for example, for melanoma. So for black skin cancer, um, machines are better in diagnosing black skin cancer than dermatologists. Um, so, you know, making sense out of images is probably the field where artificial intelligence um, is really ahead today already um, compared to doctors. So radiology, um, but also um, inspection, skin inspection, for example, these are topics which um, are pretty easily covered by artificial intelligence. And I, I would expect that's something we're going to see in the next few years 
that we will have automatic systems um, to look into this. So, for example, at University Hospital in Basel, they are building a new system where you can have 360 degrees of uh, photographs taken of the skin and then an algorithm um, which identifies the different skin lesions. So that's something which is already moving slowly into clinical practice. It's still research, but I expect it to move into practice within the next few years. Um, what we haven't seen so far is a trial um, testing prediction of therapy. So a trial looking at bi biology and then saying, well, based on this biology, that's the most promising treatment. You have the highest chance of success and the lowest chance of having adverse events. That's something we haven't seen yet. Um, and, you know, when you think of oncology, for example, or other uh, entities, uh, hematological malignancies and so on, um, The bigger challenge still lies in predicting the correct therapy and not um, uh, the correct diagnosis. So we can diagnose more than 90% of cancers correctly. But if the question is, you know, how many patients are going to respond to a given therapy, for many therapies it's still 50% or 60% or sometimes 70%, and that's considered to be good. So we're far away um, from an accurate prediction of response probability. And I, I'm doubtful whether we will ever get to 100% correct yeah, uh, judgment, also knowing that uh, even today yeah, we have weaknesses in our system and we're not reaching 100% yet, otherwise we wouldn't need anything else, of course. But did I get that right, that in order to trust these algorithms to make sense or to, to, to be accepted as a decision-making tool, They need to be validated in your eyes in, in clinical settings where, where, you, where you kind of have a head-to-head -head between a machine versus a set of doctors uh, predicting a disease or predicting an outcome or predicting, sorry, not a disease, but a, a response to, to a treatment or, or side effects that is uh, then head-to-head -head kind of tested against the, uh, the, the doctor's decision. Yes, definitely. I mean... Uh, Again, an example. Um, at, at the Cantonal Hospital in Baseland, we do have a molecular tumor board. Mm -hmm. So we look at the biology, do the sequencing, immunohistochemistry, fish analysis, and so on. Um, and then we gather all data on mutations, on expression patterns, and so on. Um, but finally, it's, it's a group of doctors who need to decide what therapy is given. Mm -hmm. And this comes with a price. The price is we ignore or disregard all information which we cannot weigh. Mm -hmm. So if we don't know what it means, we will just disregard it. Mm -hmm. So if we really want to make use of all the information which has become available already through new means um, of testing, NGS, next generation sequencing, for example, but also through big data, looking at large patient cohorts and clinical outcomes, we will need to have some support there because otherwise um, we will get stuck uh, with using just a very small fraction of the knowledge which is available. And even if these tools would be available, uh, now also a little self-critique here, I'm also a medic by train, but have we really been trained to use these tools to understand where where data is coming from, how algorithms work. Um, are doctors prepared uh, during their studies in the right way as, as we're seeing that? Because you're also teaching at the university hospital. I mean, do you have the sense this is, this is already there? It's on the curriculum or, or do we need to change there as well? Well, I think it's moving. So universities have started to build programs. So there are programs, also postgraduate programs, for example, for personalized molecular oncology. Um, we've just run the first uh, um, course um, uh, in our institution. Um, but basically, you know, um, I think these, these algorithms, once they are tested in a clinical trial, the difference is not so big compared to what we are doing nowadays. Mm -hmm. If you do a test now, you measure one gene and then you predict what the therapy is. Nobody says the machine is telling you what you have to do. If you say you have to look it up in the book, nobody says, oh, well, the book is telling you what you have to do. So if, if, we, if we look at it rather from the perspective, it's a more complex testing. And then the algorithm comes up with a series of proposals. It's not so very different from what we are doing nowadays. And I think doctors will be ready to embrace that once it has been tested in clinical trials. As once there is that thrust in, you know? into the current black box I, exactly. of an algorithm, um, huh? Okay. Yeah, but the black box, you know, black box, even if you have a drug, you look at preclinical data. 
um, sometimes we find out later on that the mechanism which was predicted is completely wrong. So testing um, a, a drug in a clinical setting can be something like a black box. That's why you test it in the empirical setting, because you can really demonstrate there's a benefit of doing this therapy. And for the algorithm, it's exactly the same. Even though it may to a certain degree be a black box, as long as you can prove it improves outcomes, um, doubts will be much smaller. Yeah. And still, once on the market, also there, something can happen still, right? Um, sure, yeah. sure. But um, basically, you know, you would test the algorithms as you do drugs. So first against guidelines and then against another algorithm. And there's a new series of trials testing algorithms one against the other. That future of healthcare sounds um, uh, very promising yeah? um, in terms of us getting more empowered, um, getting more uh, preventative solutions that are um, uh, taking advantage of globally available insights and data and more integrated into our normal lives. Yeah? But it's not there yet. Yeah? It's not a reality yet. What are the things uh, that you think are required to make that uh, future a reality? Well, basically, I think that the different um, players, including, um, for example, regulators, healthcare providers, um, but also let's call them prediction providers, you know, uh, handling information and, and giving prediction. Um, we need these different players around the table and we need them to discuss how regulation is to look like for this prediction. Um, and this regulation is going to be different than the regulation we see now for, for approving drugs, for example. Um, we need to know what, what the business model is behind that. What, what about patents? You know? can, we, can we have patents then on these predictions? Or um, is, it, is it more like a CE grade? Is it a medical device in the end? Um, I think these are discussions we should have and, and find the spot where we can place um, uh, these artificial intelligence um, predictions um, and these new models um, so that they can benefit um, patients. And also a key question is who's take the risk um, if there is a prediction wrong yeah? and, and, and who's taking liabilities uh, could also yeah, be. But the, the risk, so the question um, concerned the risk is very easy. The risk lies with the patient. Um, if um, there's no response, um, then there's a malefit for the patient. Liability is much more difficult, you know, because so far as a physician, you do a prediction. If you're wrong, you're not liable. Um, you're just wrong. Um, if uh, we do elaborate prediction models based on AI and the rate of prediction is going to be higher and you can demonstrate the rate of prediction is higher than what your physician predicts, um, I think it's going to be the same. I mean, uh, Still the doctor would be liable in that response or would the AI provider, the, the prediction provider then be reliable for it? Yeah, but I think basically, you know, you, you need to show you did the best prediction you could. That's what you need to show as a physician. That's what you need to show as an AI. If you did that and you proved to be wrong, um, I think it's not a question of, of liability. And I guess we will not get to the point where we will have a 100% response rate. That's not going to happen. I mean, science argues against that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, let's be frank. <laughs> um, but, I mean, what, what is the liability if, for example, you know, the algorithm is messed up? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, it's the same question as asking for who is liable if, if um, there's a self-driving car. Um, then, um, in some way, the producer um, uh, plays a role in that, whether the liability lies completely with the, you know, the company responsible for the algorithm or it's a shared liability, I don't know. But, but, but surely, just listening to our conversation and discussion around it, you can have different perspectives on exactly those uh, elements, right? And, and they are important to be discussed, aligned and ironed out. And, um, I mean, your, your kind of call for action is here um, let's group around a round table. Uh, let's have um, all the ones uh, having an interest around the well-being of people and, and patients uh, at the table and, and have the big ticket questions discussed. And I think it's very important to do that and to do it pretty soon because we want to have innovative industry in this field. Um, and if the industry shies away from the field because, you know, um, legal questions are not resolved, um, this will just slow down the field. 
So we, we should make sure patients will have benefit um, of this information, of these new technologies um, soon. And uh, b b my personal opinion here is, uh, I mean, innovation will not stop because we are not getting our head around those questions, right? If something is possible, it will happen eventually somewhere in the world. So um, getting our head around um, uh, that is, is required and we should not shy away from the complexity. Yes, yeah, by absolutely. all means, it is complex. But if we can't solve it, now taking a European perspective here, um, if we can't solve it, we, we just need to live with realities that are that are made elsewhere. I mean, I guess. We want to trust into the solutions. Yeah. In order to be able to trust in the solutions, we need to be part of the solution. Otherwise, you know, the solution is kind of produced somewhere else and then it's take it or leave it. And I think it's not a nice perspective as a patient um, uh, to have the choice, well, you can use it. We don't really know what it does. Um, but if you don't, there's nothing else. So I think that's the wrong way to go. So just anticipating that um, we would have uh, predictive algorithms that give us means to decide upon or, or just take that decision and, and implement that with your patient. Um, is there a risk of a doctor becoming kind of a more of a mechanic um, who is just uh, implementing a, uh, a decision that, would, <laughs> that was made somewhere else? Well, I would guess, you know, many people are indeed afraid of that perspective because they feel they're going to lose kind of, uh, you know, self-determination, so they're not able to, to, to choose anymore. But I think it's wrong. I mean, nowadays you do a test, you do a lab test, or you do, you know, again, sequencing, um, and then basically um, you open your textbook um, uh, either physically or you just got your textbook in your mind um, and uh, you know the trial so you know what there is to do. If you change this into a formal algorithm and there's a software instead of your textbook, I frankly don't see really a big difference. Um, in the end, I would hope the algorithm will give us a list, a ranked list, which is the best therapeutic options. Um, uh, there are and then um, we need to consider side effects you know if the first drug on the list has a side effect which is not acceptable to, to the patient we need to move to the second drug and that's not principally different from what we are doing nowadays so um, the, the next question is you know w would you like to have a doctor which disregards 90% of the information and um, tells you what you need to do or would you like to have an algorithm taken into account, I don't know, 50%, 60%, whatever we will get to, um, and then the doctor counseling you on um, what the best therapy is? Yeah, I mean, sure. Maybe a rhetorical question, but uh, yeah, no, 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 for no, me no, personally, absolutely. the answer is very clear. No, absolutely. And, and to me personally, I think it, it really, it heavily depends on what we're talking about. I mean, would I be happy to read on a computer screen, uh, oh, Thomas, you have a flu, I would be happy to, to take this, right? But would we be happy to read on a screen, oh, sorry, but you have uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, without their um, uh, a physical person, uh, a well-trained, a well-experienced doctor being there who can psychologically support you in that very moment? I would have my uh, feeling to that, right? So a flu might be okay, Definitely. but if we talk something serious, it might not be so okay. But I think that's really a difference, you know, the, the algorithm um, giving you the best therapeutic options is something which will not really change the relationship between a patient and the doctor. Mm -hmm. Having a machine giving you the diagnosis and proposing therapy, that's something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in principle, uh, um, the, the principle, so to say, will stay the same as long as um, AI-driven decision-making is tested um, in a comparable way uh, that, that drugs are tested today. Uh, probably quicker, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but um, they need to have kind of a rigid system behind that that backs up. It, it is something to, to trust. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we recently came across um, uh, our German Minister um, of Health, Jens Spahn, commenting on, on cancer and, and, and saying something in the range of cancer will soon be curable, which uh, obviously was something um, uh, that, that was uh, covering media uh, throughout and, and probably also didn't make stop at the oncologist level. So um, 
posing that question with someone who is uh, working day in day out in cancer and, and oncology is that statement valid will cancer soon be curable slash um, based on the future of health also be preventable you know politicians have have declared war on cons already several decades ago is that <laughs> you know, <so> president <laughs> nixon has done this already um and and so far it's it's not proven to be right um I think the situation has changed because, you know, let's say 15 years ago, um, long-term survivors of metastatic cancer were very rare. Um, okay. So if you could not do surgery, then usually there was no long-term survival. This has changed. So we, we, we've got new sets of therapies, targeted agents, but also immunotherapy um, agents. And nowadays we guess that one in five patients will... Um, get into a chronic phase. Um, whether this means cure, we cannot say yet because um, the new drugs are there since seven or eight years. So nobody can say what happens after 20 years or 30 years. Um, but for some compounds, we do have data for 10 years and uh, people who've been treated are free of relapse for many years. And I mean, you know, um, if you do an educated guess, you would say there's a good chance that they will be cured at some point. But first, it's still a minority. It's 20 percent. And we don't, you know, the other 80 percent still will at some point die from um, malignant disease. Um, and on the other hand, um, we do not yet have real long-term outcomes. So uh, we don't know how it looks like after 20 years, 30 years. And we don't know what it means in terms of, of side effects, long-term side effects. You know, if, if, if you really get cured, then what is the price? Do, do you have more cardiovascular disease? Do you have more kidney disease? At least for, for um, uh, cancers um, of children, it has been shown um, for example, the chance of getting a hip replacement is 50 times the chance of somebody who did not suffer from childhood cancer. That's something you would not predict yeah. um, easily. It's not because, obvious. You yeah. know, why do you think of hip replacement um, in the setting of cancer and chemotherapy? As an oncologist, any, any suggestion for us as, as the normal society uh, on how we could uh, prevent uh, um, oncology uh, situations, cancer situations in future? Is there anything... The, the, the three or five things that we should stop doing? Well, there are some very easy things and, and, and there are difficult things. So, I mean, stopping to smoke is an easy thing. Okay, tick. It's <laughs> something, you know, we know, we've been knowing for 30 or 40 years. So it's, it's very clear. Yeah. It has a huge impact. Um, 100 years ago, lung cancer was described as a very rare disease. Mm -hmm. And we can get back to having lung cancer, a very rare disease if, if we quit smoking. Um, but other things are much more difficult. You know, for example, people guess that, um, you know, healthier food, healthier food could have an impact. The largest trial ever run in Europe was almost half a million people for 9.7 years. And they looked at the incidence of cancer and the difference was between 2 and 3%. So there may be a certain impact but the impact is not huge smoking so it's, uh, stopping to smoke is much more <laughs> preventative has than, much more than impact okay. than for example changing um, your habits what you eat it's not the same if you look at cardiovascular disease so the risk of of, of getting um, a heart attack whatever um, was decreased by around 30 percent but there was a small difference for cancer so um, you know the question is can we really um get rid of all risk factors for cancer. So when people switched from um, one type of cigarette to uh, cigarettes with filters, for example, um, the rate of one type of lung cancer dropped and the rate of another lung cancer um, histology um, increased. So, so some events probably just happen. They are stochastic. So I'm not sure we really can get rid of all risk factors. It, it it does ring a bell uh, in my head at least, and and um, obviously oncology is different from cardiovascular diseases, from neurodegenerative diseases, and you name them. But um, if we look into that future of healthcare, um, uh, things will be much more data driven, AI enabled, uh, more preventative, more 
at uh, at uh, at the customer's uh, fingertips uh, rather than the patients uh, itself um helping themselves via digital health solutions so on and so forth who is going to drive that change in your eyes um because you you have the the, the traditional players uh, the academics the the providers um, the the payers the the pharma industry the medtech industry uh, that have uh, humongously big knowledge in healthcare and and how to kind of work and maneuver in that highly regulated market and at the same time you're having the new kids on the on the healthcare block at least big tech entering big times and just looking at the at the usual suspects like an Alphabet, an Amazon, an Apple, if we talk about the US or or an Alibaba and a Tencent uh, from the, from the Chinese side, I mean, they have been massively putting efforts in in, in entering the space uh, when it comes to M and A and partnering and joint ventures, but also when when talking about uh, patent filings. I mean, those five that I just mentioned, they they by now already own more than six thousand health related patents. So where do you see that happening first? Is it more the traditional players? Is it more the tech players or anything in between? Now, I, I don't think that the tech companies will any time soon really go in, into the development of completely new drugs. I mean, there's a lot of science behind that. They could do that. They do have the money to do it, um, but they also need the people to do it. Um, but they could uh, at the same time probably go into prevention of it, right? But uh, they could go into prevention. That's that's one thing I, I think they, they will do as well. And the other one is they will go into prediction, mm -hmm. which in a way is going to be, you know... Um, when you look at classical phase three trials, so um, uh, doing real prediction could be uh, something which takes the place of phase three trials at some point. So basically, uh, bottom line is they, they might not enter the the highly regulated drug development markets so much yeah, when talking about innovative drugs where we have development cycles of 10 to 12 years, uh, but more into fast-paced data and algorithm-based uh, solutions in healthcare, yeah, um, which is more close to what they are used to do now. And why shouldn't they be good in predicting certain diseases or, or outcomes when they can predict Uh, and it's not not like for like here, but if they can predict what what we are uh, about to buy next without us knowing what we are going to buy next, yeah? you know, if they are better in predicting what is the right therapy, it's fine. I mean, there's no rule why one company should do it and the other one should not. Um, but they need to test it in, in into a system which we trust in. Um, uh, it's 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 difficult if you if you put out information without giving guidance on that. But on that point, um, one question that, that I'm getting my head around that at least, or driving my head around it, is looking into these Amazon, Uber, Airbnb and, and alike models. Um, what they are doing is they are enablers. Yeah? They are choosing this is the right product for you at the right time and this is the right taxi that is next to you that drives you from A to B. So they are enabling by connecting a customer to someone who provides something and they are, they are getting a margin uh, or a cut of the price in the range of 20 to 30%. Yeah? Is that something... Uh, that we are also going to see in healthcare, which is in a close to 11 trillion market, quite substantial and attractive business. Yeah. Well, yeah, I I'm sure they're going to try. Um, and I'm sure this is going to be in a way beneficial because we need to have, you know, kind of a new view on the whole system, uh, including data. Um, the question is, you know, if we say they are enabler, what are they enabling and what are they trading in? Is this information or is this prediction or is this drugs? That's not the same. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, entering the information market, that's obvious. I mean, that's what they have been doing um, already quite some time ago. Entering the prediction market, well, um, it's something they haven't really done yet. Um, but I think that's something um, they will try. Um, and if you see what, what models they've got, um, I mean, I'm really looking forward to see how these models will perform in a real-life healthcare setting. Um, what I don't know is whether they, they will in any way at some point really go into trial. 
So that's something, you know, classical pharma industry has got no problems with it. They will do it at some point. But what are the, what are the tech companies going to do? Are they ever going to run a trial on that? So that's really a question I would like to ask the people in charge. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but let me ask one final question then on this. Um, if, if there would be such a marketplace for let's call it healthcare solutions, be it a drug or be it a, a smart t-shirt or be it an app or be it whatever. Yeah? If there is such a marketplace at some point that, that takes away the 20 to 30% cut, if you have one bet, which, which player would that be? Not talking about specific company names, but would that be rather someone from the traditional or rather someone from the non-traditionals or something completely different? One bet. <laughs> I know I make it hard now. Yeah, it's very, it's very hard. <laughs> it's a good question, but um, I think it really depends on whether you know. If if, if people pay it out of the pocket, I would bet on the tech companies mm -hmm. because that's very easy. You know, they can just do it. If people then buy it, it's fine. That's the deal. It's it's how it happens. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's going to stay in a highly regulated market and you will still have a gatekeeper who decides whether you receive actual therapy or treatment, um, then I'm a bit doubtful because um, if the regulation is going to stay, they will have to bow to the regulation. So either the regulation is gone or they will have to bow to the regulation. And if they have to bow to the regulation, it means they need to run trials. Yeah. So it, it's either A or B. Yeah, so they, they might even shy away from that yeah regulation yeah, is needed yeah. yeah okay good so it might be tech yeah if out of pocket if kind of the the the, the people are paying more more themselves for it yeah but if it's it's continuing to be a highly regulated market especially in the in the treatment setting then uh, it might be not them yeah i mean the next question obviously is you know who would you trust your data You know, would you give your data to the tech companies or to the pharma companies? Well, who who if, do you if trust? The choice is yeah. you. So that's one question I'm, <laughs> I'm giving back to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's clearly someone, and and that is that is a tough question. It is clearly someone who has the least personal or the least business interest in my data. This is where I would have the most trust. As soon as there is uh, an individual interest of a company, of an organization to do something with that data, uh, then uh, trust is hampered. Yeah? So, but it's, it's not a clear-cut answer, um, which is one side. And the other side is where I'm getting the best for me personally. Yeah, so even if it's a highly trustful organization that I'm entrusting my data with, if I'm not getting the best outcome for, for me in, in, in terms of healthcare, of staying healthy, not getting sick, or, or getting the, the, the best treatment whenever in need for it, um, that, that I'm not trusting that, that company or that organization either. Yeah? So I, I, I want to have kind of a, a good balance of, of trust and neutrality at the same time uh, paired with good outcomes uh, and, and kind of return of data and trustment. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Um, I think as a society, you know, we in the end we should ask that if we get information, if we get prediction, um, the end point, you know, what do we get out of it is a beneficial outcome. So in terms of health. Yeah. So it needs to be driven by um, endpoints which are you know, related to health and not um, isolated by endpoints which are driven by economical considerations. And I think that's something that I guess society will ask for. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and that's, that's a very good ending, um, I have to say, with, with that statement. So w what do we have as kind of the, the key takeaways for, of that session today? I think we, we clearly understood that oncology ever was complex uh, but is unseen complex uh, in in terms of um, the the choices you have to make the the analytics and the, the data points that you need to integrate that that drives hope for people but uncertainty at the same time because uh, who wants to be the one who is not getting the support needed um, second ai is going to be needed definitely uh, True. because you, you, you sure can't really that. cope with uh, what, what's going to be produced as we speak uh, and it will become the new normal in future The good thing is that you're giving us hope that education of our doctors is is on the right path. Yeah? Um, more to come. When talking about um, who is going to make that change happening, there, there might be um, 
a play for tech, yeah? especially in the area of where, where data is going to be needed, where predictions are going to be made. But they might be shying away from, from a highly regulated market or need to adapt uh, to to uh, to cope with that. So in, in essence, big changes are coming in healthcare uh, for sure. Um, uh, where they are coming from and how quick they are coming from, really here the race is open and only time will tell who is going to make that race. So Andreas, thanks a lot for, for your time, for, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, very interesting uh, and, and insightful. And I hope for everyone listening uh, to that conversation, it was insightful and, and, and helpful to, to understand that perspective from a, from, from a clinician, from an oncologist uh, who's working in that space day in, day out. Stay tuned for our next series uh, where we're going to take a, a different perspective uh, next time, basically, from the academic side and I'm very much looking forward to discussing those insights and implications there. So thanks very much. Take care. Strategy and strategy made real.